Hi, this is Jennifer LeClaire, and this is Prophetic Reset. I'm here with Apostle Ryan Lestrange and Apostle Brian Williams. We're talking about and tackling issues that have been present in prophetic ministry for decades. And in light of the reset, we want to dive into these issues to try to bring some understanding, to shed some light from our perspectives on what God is saying, how he wants us to learn and grow from the moment of time we find ourselves in. Today's question, today's topic is, whew, this is going to be a hot one. Is there idolatry in the prophetic movement? Do some Christians tend to idolize prophets? And I know this is a controversial question because if you even suggest that, many people get so angry. How dare you say I idolize a prophet? But if you look at the response that some prophets get, it is as if they can do no wrong, as if they can say no wrong. They could be caught in sin. It would be brushed under the rug. Uh, They could be completely wrong. People will make excuses for why they weren't really wrong. They're really right. And I think it's potentially um, destructive to what God is trying to do. It is destructive to what God is trying to do in the earth. Remember in the book of Psalms twice, the Bible speaks of those who worship idols become like the ones they serve, having eyes but cannot see, ears that cannot hear, and a mouth that cannot speak. In other words, if we begin to idolize prophets, guess what? We're blinded to the truth. We're not hearing the voice of the Lord for ourselves, and we don't have a voice of our own. So I think it's very dangerous. Now, do I believe that most people people are idolizing prophets? No. Do most uh, Christians idolize prophets? No. Most Christians don't even believe in prophets. But there is a growing segment in the body of Christ that just really rapidly follow certain prophets, and it wouldn't matter what they said. They're not judging it. And that's a big key here. Uh, How do you know if you're idolizing a prophet, you don't judge their prophetic words? Wow. You take what they say as gospel. Yeah, that's huge. I think we were talking about this just the other day that when some, I mean, even when someone prophesies to you personally, you should immediately have some discernment about that word. Is this a word if, you know, if Apostle Brian, you come to me and go, God said you're going to Europe for six months, and I've never heard this. It's never been in my prayer time. It's nothing I've thought about. And I don't immediately take that word just because I love you and trust you and run with it. But many people do do that. And the word of God, the written word's always going to agree With the spoken word, I was thinking in our last segment that we filmed, the scripture, the Bible said the just shall live by faith. Faith deals with the unknown, that you are walking forward and you you don't know every detail. The Lord doesn't show you every detail, but sometimes we do get into idolatry because we're so hungry for inside information. And we were discussing before we started filming, I believe the spirit is a dimension. Uh, I like what Lester Sermon you say. If your spiritual eyes were open, you would see demons and angels trafficking in the airspace above our head. And we have a pretty strong biblical example of that. Um, so, you know, like Michael, we see him warring in the heavens. We see so many examples of this, but that's a dimension. So many people could get so hungry for the supernatural, they could go into the spirit dimension, deal with familiar spirits, imitating angels, the Holy Spirit, spirits of dead people and give them information, then they're related. It seems accurate, but if we don't discern the thing behind the thing, now we're in trouble. So I do think Christians do get involved in idolatry, unfortunately, with prophets and with all fivefold gifts. And I think one thing that's important to note about idolatry is that either we will worship in spirit and truth or we will be idolaters. We are naturally created, supernaturally in one sense, to worship something or someone. And so when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, When Paul is rebuking the church, he says, you know, some of you guys are saying, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Peter, I'm of Paul. And he says, who are we but mere ministers through whom you've received the gospel? And then he compares them to just mere men who are behaving carnally. So when you have a carnal church culture, it produces idolatry. What we fix our idolatry on is just a matter of who we're exposed to. So in the case of the golden calf with Aaron or I was just reading this morning, it's been burning in my spirit in 1 Samuel chapter 4, even the children of Israel who idolized the Ark of the Covenant. There's a story, go read it in 1 Samuel chapter 4, where they were defeated, 4,000 men of Israel were defeated in a day, and then the elders are praying, they're like, Lord, why have we been defeated before our enemies? And they thought, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. It, It literally says, and it will save us. As we know, the ark was never meant to replace the presence of God. It was a type of shadow of obviously Christ ultimately. But 
their confidence, their faith was in the actual box itself. And so they went out to battle. It says they shouted, the earth rang, and then they went out to battle and were defeated before their enemies. And so it was, again, idolatry. So that is a human condition. Whenever we're carnally driven, as Paul said in Galatians, if we're, we walk after the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we're not walking after the spirit, our flesh is going to fixate on an object or a person. And idolatry is the default of the human condition. So it's I don't even think it's something to like, you know, beat ourselves up about. We just need to be honest and realize our frailty that by nature, idolatry is commonplace. Yeah, I think that's a great thought. When you're speaking, I'm remembering twice in Scripture when Paul, when they tried to they tried to make him a god, they they, oh, yes. they, they were idolizing him because you know yeah. first he didn't die with the snake that that was later the first time he and was a Barnabas they were saying you're yeah. Zeus and you're I yeah. mean and, and they were like no 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 so yeah. I think that uh, you're absolutely accurate. People are always I mean I'm sure there's there certain people that idolize us as leaders in in a way. I mean there we don't we don't welcome that we don't want that but we can't help what, how other people view us or see us, right? Some people hate us and some people think that we are the best thing since sliced bread. However, as leaders, as prophets, I think the onus on us is those who are, we are in community with, when we sense that there is an unhealthy dynamic where they think we can do no wrong, that's where we need to bring correction to those who we, who, who we lead, just like Paul did. They're yeah. like, no, 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 they didn't let that happen. There was a young woman in my ministry, and when all the stuff with the election prophecy started blowing up, I pulled her aside one morning on Sunday, and I said, listen, this is what I believe. I am not in the majority with what I believe. You see what everyone else is saying. I'm telling you what I believe. Now, I don't want you to answer me right now, but I want you to go and I want you to pray through this process. And when this is over, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to ask you, what did you conclude? I want you to think critically. I don't want you to believe me just because I'm saying it. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I don't want you to pray about it. I want you to ponder it. But do not take my word as gospel. And she actually navigated through that. And I went back to her. I said, well, what did you conclude? And she said, well, I was really worried about the church. I thought we were going to lose all our members. Now, I never said anything about all this in my church to begin with. That showed me that either A, she didn't really believe me. Or B, she thought that the people in the church didn't believe me, and, and we're still sorting that out. We're still pr- walking through this together. But I always tell people, if, if you don't agree with me, please don't just please just tell me, because I don't want to be wrong, and I have enough fear of the Lord. So yeah. I think as leaders, we have to not allow people to idolize us when they're in our proximity. That was my thought, is, is how do we walk through, and what advice could we give maybe to prophets, emerging prophets, established prophets, to, to make that more difficult for people. I mean, my first thought is humility. I think everybody I've ever known in ministry who's had an extreme supernatural mantle, I can think of people I've encountered that just there was unusual miracles that happened when you were around them. And usually they had an unusual relationship with the Lord, meaning it was different from what I saw of other people. And so that drew maybe a curiosity that people want to figure out what is this thing they've got going on and in a negative way, it could cause us as people to kind of lift them up. And so my thought is one way that we could diminish this potential in our ministries, and as those of you that are called the prophetic, is perhaps to just be intentional about those kind of thoughts. Like to say, look, I missed it. I have missed it. I want you to take what I'm preaching and, and line it up with the Word of God and examine it and really from the best of our abilities, perhaps just be more relatable on some level to people. But I mean, that's my thought is how can we diminish this? Well, I agree with you. I think it's very practical. We have to just kind of be willing to get out the way. And everyone likes to be affirmed. Everyone likes to be celebrated. Um, That's not sinful. But there is a line where it becomes idolatry. And so as a result, People they don't know any better. You as the leader have to lead by example. And so that's one of the reasons why you look at Paul's life. You know, he refers to himself as the chief of all sinners, the least of the apostles, when clearly based on the resume, based on how God used him, he was actually the preeminent one. But his view of himself was that I'm just really a sinner who's been saved by grace and transformed into the image of Christ. So he imparted that, you know, and I think that's really where leaders have to have that. It really can't be manufactured. It has to flow from the inside out. That's so good. And I think that that's, you know, we want to honor people. I'm thinking like we, I want to honor people who've paid a price to walk in what they walk in. And I think sometimes in certain generations, that's not always understood well. 
But at the same time, I love what you said about Paul and how his resume so exceeded those of his contemporaries, yet the way he presented himself was not that way. And I think we can take a life lesson from that and strive to really be more vulnerable, more transparent, more humble, and to point people back to Jesus, which is what a prophet should do. A prophet should, and you hit the nail on the head. It's it's humility. It's it's allowing people to see that you're not perfect. I mean, if you're doing life with people, we're not talking about people out there on the internet idolizing us. There's nothing we can do about that. They don't have proximity. But if we create a culture in which we're untouchable, we're going to fall. And so I think it's toxic. But you know, we both spent time under Mike Pickle's ministry, and he he always says this. Listen, uh, you know, if if I've said something, I want you to go read it in your Bible for yourself. Don't don't just I'm teaching. I've got the platform. I'm giving you scripture. If you can't see it in your Bible, those are the exact where it is. If you can't see it in your Bible, you know, don't believe it. Just come talk to me about it in an honorable way, right? Come share with me what you're seeing. And so humility is sorely needed in the body of Christ. The fear of the Lord is sorely needed in the body of Christ. King uh, King uh, Herod, uh, the, he, they, he allowed the people to I. I, you know, to, to lift him up and call, you know, this is the voice of God. And he was eaten by worms. Nebuchadnezzar, he touched God's glory. And so as prophets, because knowledge puffs up okay. as prophets, we just have to be very careful. Again, everything we receive as prophets comes from God. We can't touch his glory. And if we yeah. teach that and we model that, if we wear that, then the people around us won't, they will honor us, which they should. Honor is important, and I don't. I don't demand honor. I don't. I'm like you have to honor me, but it is an important value. But if we, if we, honor and idolatry can sometimes there can be a thin line between the two. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, closing thought on that. Just one scripture comes to mind while you're speaking. Jesus, the example. So John 13, the Bible says he takes the towel with which he was girded. And he washes disciples' feet. So he models. He says, "I'm showing you an example." And I think again that posture of Servant leadership will safeguard us as leaders and the people who were called to serve from idolatry. So, yeah. And my closing thought to tag on that is that I think it's in Mark. I think it's actually through several of the Gospels, but I think I like the version of Mark. Jesus is in the midst of a city shaking revival. That's my version of events because that's how I view it. To us, we would have been like, we've arrived and we're staying in this city and we're going to like break this open. Yeah. But they go looking for Jesus, can't find him because he's withdrawn to pray. And it said to me personally, like he still needed that daily reset in his life. And I think that that's where real humility comes from. I don't know about everybody else, but I know for me, when I've really messed up or gotten on a wrong train of thought about something or acted out, it never survives strong prayer because in strong prayer, the Lord always takes the fire to me. And so I think if we keep that as sort of the pinnacle, our, our devotion life, then everything else will sort itself out. Everything else will sort itself out. And we're going to keep trying to sort out some of these issues. We don't have all the answers, but we feel like this will spark a discussion among you and your friends, your leaders, those who follow your ministries. And we believe in prophetic ministry. We're going to talk though in the next episode about this. Is the modern day church too dependent on profits. We'll be back with you real soon. A reset of the prophetic movement is upon us. The second wave of prophets is rising in this hour. We stand at the edge of a new era in the prophetic. We're gathering the international prophetic community at the Global Prophetic Center, a hub for prophetic training, prophetic labs, summits, networks, and lighthouses. It's time for prophets to go deeper. It's time for seers to soar. It's time for prophetic voices to rise up and decree what says the Spirit of God with accuracy that causes the world to pay attention. The Global Prophetic Center offers proven prophetic systems and structures to equip you to walk worthy of your calling and to prophesy with precision, boldness, diplomacy, and wisdom. Get hands-on training and mentoring in a safe environment that breeds true prophetic community and learning. Receive impartation and activation. Sharpen your gift and avoid prophetic pitfalls. Get commissioned. Get networked. Get sent out with the word of the Lord in your mouth and the confidence to release it. Begin your journey today by applying at globalpropheticcenter.com.